welcome to the Mindful Soul Center podcast. My name is Amy Adams. I'm your host and the broadcaster of this podcast. In this episode of the Mindful Soul Center podcast, I interview Rachel Ear. She is a wellness expert, a womb expert, a women's health expert, and her knowledge is so extensive. She answered so many questions that this interview has been broken into two episodes. In part one, we discuss estrogen dominance, resetting hormonal patterns, emotions, cravings, postpartum depression, and much more. The second part digs deep into charting and how it can empower you and really how you can use this information to change your life. So before we get started, I just want to ask you to please check our website, themindfulsoulcenter.com, where you can read our magazine, a new bi-monthly. It's loaded with information. We have some regular features and we will be supplementing our podcast episodes with some focused articles as well. So I hope you'll check that out and let's get started. Rachel, who is also known as Da-dum, the period whisperer. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Rachel. Welcome to the podcast. Hi. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. And she focuses on women's health and she is a menstrual health expert. Let's just get down to it. The whole thing about periods, um, yeah. we love them and we hate them. <laughs> so. I asked Rachel why women come to her in general. Is it pain, infertility, or something else? <laughs> it's all of that. So a lot of people come to me because they've got period pain or bad PMS, or maybe they're trying to conceive and it's not working. Some of them will know they've got a diagnosis of something, but whatever treatment path they're going down just isn't working for them. It doesn't oh. feel right. It's not having expected effects. Others have been put on the pill and they feel it's not working well for them and their bodies. Other people are like, I know there's something wrong. I know, and this is something really important, period pain and PMS is not normal. It's a symptom. So they know that, which is wonderful, but they just don't know how to go about it. Well, what could be the possible root causes and what they could do to make that better. And then other people will come to me because they've been trying to conceive for a long time. They've gone for a battery of tests but nothing necessarily has come up or things have come up, but they've only been given a few treatment options and they don't realize that there's this whole other world of things such as nutrition and abdominal massage and all these other yummy things that can uh, really, really help. I guess in families, genetically, we probably have some of the same kind of experiences as our moms do. So like for me, I thought that PMS was normal. <laughs> I thought that pain was normal. So. And if you think about it, society makes jokes about women being ratty at a certain time of month. And people like the current president um, saying to a journalist, oh, you must be on your period because she said something he doesn't like. It's become part of our normal way of treating periods. And that's the really frustrating thing because that kind of normalizes something that could be fixed actually with with a little bit of effort, but it's not you know, something that's really difficult to fix. It's completely achievable for most people. Mm -hmm. Is it like the level of hormones that cause that? Is that the primary Usually, cause? Yeah. So that all period problems have the same sort of root causes. Uh -huh. And the wonderful thing about hormonal imbalances is that there's actually a sort of set pattern in which to reset things and it resets all the hormones uh -huh. because they all interact with one another. One of the main causes of PMS is something called estrogen dominance. Mm -hmm. um, some people will say low progesterone. It's kind of a bit of a weird one. So what happens is after we ovulate, we produce progesterone. And that's kind of like the calming, soothing hormone. But it also ramps up thyroid activity and heats up our body a little bit because theoretically we could be pregnant and it's trying to make a warm nest 
for the egg to nestle in in the lining until the placenta grows. But there's all these other wonderful things that progesterone does for us. So it nurtures the thyroid, it helps um, with bone density, it helps with heart health, it helps with breast health. It does a number of other things and we're designed that way for progesterone to help us. Mm -hmm. at that point in our cycle but we do also get this estrogen surge and when we're estrogen dominant what happens is our estrogen is too high in comparison to the level of progesterone but that could be that your your progesterone is too low and your estrogen could also be too low but it's still too high in this ratio or progesterone could be normal and estrogen is too high or both could be too high, um, mm-hmm. according to lab tests, but the estrogen is still too high ratio-wise. And some people will say that's low progesterone, but we usually call it estrogen dominance. Yeah. And that's yeah. probably the most common cause of PMS, but it's also a factor for heavy periods, painful periods, endometriosis, painful breasts, mm-hmm. um, a whole slew of other <laughs> things as well. So. That, that is one of the, the biggest underlying causes. And the other thing with PMS as well, to bear in mind, is it's not always your body. <laughs> it could be that you have a gripe that is a perfectly realistic gripe. Mm-hmm. Um, for example, you shouldn't be picking up your partner's socks or laundry or whatever or be expected <laughs> to, to do everything after them. And it really, really bugs you but that's the time of month that it come kind of comes out and explodes and sometimes uh-huh. that happens so I do say to people is it is it really PMS or do you have something legitimate I mean obviously if you feel like you want a divorce for two days a month and you find the rest <laughs> of the time that's PMS but you know if you don't normally have it but you're really finding that you're you're getting right. a bit angry about something do listen to that anger too uh huh. My former partner actually, he would say to me that he always knew when I was just about to have my period because I was more agitated, I guess. And I guess it was a little more obvious that he was used to it after years and years and years. I actually have like a kind of weird, maybe, maybe it's not a weird question, but I think it's a weird okay, question. Okay. Every month I would crave salt and sweets. <laughs> on like the first day of my cycle. And I and I know that I'm not the only person that's had that experience <laughs> at least. So, I was just wondering is there a reason for that? Is that something common? Maybe it's not common. Yeah, so different there are lots of different reasons for cravings. So, one it can be as hormones shift, we start metabolizing different nutrients, so it can be like a, a nutrient deficiency. So it could be that, and that's a very common one. Another cause for cravings is on emotional needs. Mm-hmm. Um, other causes for cravings are the changes going on with the bacteria in our gut. Most people call it the microbiome, but we call it microbiota, especially if you're um, changing what you eat. And it's actually really <laughs> interesting. Like, There's so much we don't know about what what goes on in there but there's actually a part of the microbiome called the astrobolome uh-huh. that actually um metabolizes estrogen <laughs> uh-huh. um, and we know things such as say for example you've been eating lots of ice cream and sugary stuff you start feeding and therefore populating your gut um with more bacteria that eats that but when you cut that out and you try and eat more healthier stuff those bacteria will literally send out hunger signals to your brain because they don't want to die out. So they're going to to kick off this craving for something sweet again. So there's a a whole number of different reasons for cravings. Um, Some are specific deficiencies and yeah, they can happen throughout your cycle, but the actual root cause of cravings is different from person to person. Right. But that totally makes sense, though, when you said that, you know, that there is that link and that there is something happening in your gut with the estrogen. That's really fascinating to me because it was just 
I, and I, and this is another kind of weird thing, and maybe I'm being like weird and personal on my podcast no. or whatever. No. <laughs> but I just I had this theory, and it was very so. You know, when I was younger, I was thinner, and um, I mean, not that I'm very heavy now, but I don't. I used to have this day that it was like I could eat everything that I wanted on the first day of my period. And I had like no guilt. I never gained weight. I mean, I could really, and I was hungry. I was really hungry. Is that also something that's common? Is it, are people hungrier uh, oftentimes? So, their hunger does vary, but it is interesting um, how we metabolize different foods throughout our cycle. Um, so the first half of our cycle, which we do when we chart, we usually start with day one being first day of our period. Mm -hmm. And that's actually when our hormones are at our lowest, but our brain is starting to ramp up the next ovulation. But when um, we start developing follicles in that, that part of the cycle, um, we produce more estrogen. Um, and estrogen helps us burn fat. So in that first half of our cycle, um, if there's any glucose available, we will metabolize that first. But after that's used up we start burning fat reserves and the other part of our cycle oh. is um progesterone base and once we've burnt up glucose we start burning through protein instead mm -hmm. our muscles are made of protein so if you don't have enough adequate protein base we can start burning through muscles right. um, so it is really interesting how our hormones affect what we eat and yeah. Yeah, the the hunger can can vary from person to person. You are at a point where your hormones are at your lowest, so you're probably at your most tired. Um, and some people will find that drives them to eat because they want to push up their blood sugar levels. Other people, it is genuinely they just need a bit of a oop, bit of oomph at that time, and they want to feel sort of nurtured and more cared for, and they do that through eating. But I have heard of more people. Um, getting hungry around ovulation it seems to change from person to person uh -huh. that's so fascinating actually I mean mm -hmm. I never really I have to tell you the truth I probably of course you know when you're young you learn about uh, menstruation and school and your parents hopefully will speak to you about it <laughs> hopefully and uh, my mom was a nurse so and a health teacher so that was pretty positive but we didn't have like in-depth discussions about hormones or anything <laughs> so it's just fascinating to me actually to I learn know, about there's so much that we, we're not taught at school and I think it's such a shame because there are so many women that don't know about their bodies yeah and I considered myself lucky because I don't know if you know about this book and it's, it was pretty, um, my, I had an older sister and she had, I don't know about you, but like, you know, I would, I, my older sister had a book. So of course I wanted to learn, uh, you know, whatever I could. And it was called Our Bodies, Ourselves. And it was a really great book because it actually talked about a lot more stuff than just the little pamphlet that you get that teaches yeah. you about menstruation <laughs> so, I mean it was definitely like more expansive and I think through the years it you know expanded even more and now I think it's a pretty fat book but um, there's also another doctor uh, Christiane Northrup, Northrup. yes yeah. oh, women's bodies women's wisdom yes I yeah. recommend that book to everyone it I think it should be compulsory reading for anyone who's going through periods everything from her um, MD gynecologist perspective right through to the psycho spiritual shamanic perspective so whatever way whatever lens you want to look at your body from she covers it rachel recommends dr christiane northrup's book women's bodies women's wisdom and i mentioned our bodies ourselves written by several different authors links will be in the show notes now let's get back to the interview I don't really know about many people that had their period after me. Like most of my peers had it already when they were younger than me. I was a little bit late. Um, and so I'm wondering, is there like kind of like an extreme time where somebody could have it very too young or, or maybe too old, not too old, but much older than other people? <laughs> Um, so there is something called precocious puberty, which is girls starting their periods really young and it can happen like 
around four or five. Uh Um, Even up to the age of nine used to be within that bracket, but now there seem to be more and more young girls starting quite early. Um, I started at the age of nine, but I was very tall for my age. So I I was mistaken for 13 or 14 by 13 and 14 year old boys, unfortunately. (laughs) I didn't understand why they were following me. Right. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of traumatizing when you're nine. <laughs> it was, especially when they were jumping on me in the swimming pool. I couldn't figure that one out. <laughs> My mum had to explain. Um, so, yeah, that can happen, especially if your body is physically more mature or has grown faster than, um, you know, your peers in your same age group. And there are several different theories at the moment because it seems to be more and more common that the age at which menstruation starts is reducing. Mm -hmm. Um, Some people are saying it's because we're a bit fatter and once you get puppy fat, you start producing hormones because fat is estrogenic. Um, Other people are saying it's due to the pill being in water, although there there is some sort of dispute as to whether the amount or that is in our water supply is enough to have an effect on our bodies. There's other xenoestrogens such as various different plastics that we come into contact with that have an estrogenic effect on our bodies. Wow. So all these different things could be feeding in. And then there are, um, I've heard some people talk about where young women have been forced to grow up very quickly, like maybe their fathers died or their parents have divorced and that's kind of triggered their bodies. Like, yes, I have to grow up and become more mature. So I'm going to push myself through puberty. Um, So there's all these different theories as to what's happening. And I think it probably is different from person to person. Um, But most, most girls do seem to still start within the sort of 11 to 15 age group. And then if you're sort of hitting 16 or 17 and you're not getting any signs of that happening, um, it is worth seeing your doctor. And it's also worth, you know, just seeing is other stuff happening as well? Right, are you, right. you know, yeah, because there could be hair. Are you getting breasts developing, or is it complete, completely static? Yeah, it's interesting though because when you when you explain this, now I kind of understand too because I did have a growth spurt from one year to the uh, when I was in like the thirteen years old to fourteen years old, I grew a lot, like very quickly in one year, and then I got my period so I that hear that totally a lot so <laughs> that's yeah and actually right. you know it's, it's really fast I just love this conversation because <laughs> um I mean even like some of the other girls that I knew too like actually one of them she developed very young probably one of the first out of our class and her father wasn't around he was uh so that's just fat I mean that may not be why but it's still fascinating because there's like all these different things that we don't even think about regularly so wow I'm like (laughs) I'm floored (laughs) by all of this stuff I think it's I know so much affects us in so many ways and we don't really think about it it's incredible yeah, I mean, there's just so many things in school that I think we really need to add in. I mean, about our bodies, and I'm, I'm just so amazed by this, but not even just our bodies, even just some like simple stuff that we need to know about how to live our lives. I don't think that's really taught in school. No. <laughs> Financial literacy, understanding. Yes, exactly. <laughs> it's it's okay. so true. I commented to Rachel that I thought it was interesting that many girls are starting puberty uh, very early. And at the same time, many women choose to have families and babies later in life now. Here's what she said. Usually both partners go to work, so it costs more to buy a house and to settle and become established in a job. Um, I know there was a study on my generation versus the previous generation. It'll take... The average person my age an extra 19 years to save up their first deposit compared to their parents wow. for a house so it, I don't think it's kind of that surprising that people are delaying um starting families and things and also a lot of people are being a lot more sort of mindful and choosing when to start uh especially with like the availability of IVF and other fertility technologies as well 
Now, I don't know if this is true or not, so just tell me if it's not. <laughs> so, but I also had uh, heard, and I kind of think that it might be true, um, that the fertility um, levels are like going da- decreasing. So, yes. And, um, I don't know the statistics of how they've changed. I know uh, the World Health Organization, it was one in five or one in six couples have fertility issues. Uh-huh. Um, uh, and that's really important to remember it's couples because fertility issues are 30 percent female 30 percent male and 30 percent combined oh. it's not just the woman who is infertile it oh, could be yes. a sperm problem yeah. and the same with miscarriages as well a lot of the causes of miscarriages could be a sperm problem or mm. a combined issue but everyone assumes that if she could get pregnant it must be the woman who has an issue if she yes. miscarries yeah, that's interesting to look at it that way because I was actually kind of just thinking like 50-50, you know, like the guy or the girl, one-third and one-third and one-third. That's really an interesting perspective. I think men probably um, are probably not as aware of that as women are. No, and a lot of them do take it really personally if it is that an issue that they're having. Um, and a lot of them, you know, do say to me, you know, I feel quite demasculated that I'm not providing what I need to for my partner Um, and I think that those are the more open men there are obviously a lot of men who do not want it to be a problem with them because they feel it's you know their masculinity being affected yeah that's a shame actually Mm -hmm. that it's it's so personal to someone I did have uh, know quite a few people who actually were adopting children from other countries or adopting within their own country even because um, they couldn't have children on their own a lot of women and me included um, I chose not to have children this idea of not having children there was so much pressure from the outside uh forces including a mother-in-law and other relatives and things too to to kind of conform to have this but do you think that by not having children that um that can affect your cycle there are changes that happen in your body from having children so equally if you don't have them Mm -hmm. those changes don't occur so um first of all when you do have children you're using up a lot of nutrients within your body and you do end up depleted afterwards if you're not you know eating the right things to nourish yourself Mm -hmm. um which is why you know people like the world health organization recommend spacing children so that the womb and the soft tissues have time to recover but also you know you you have time to recover all the nutrients that you lost Uh etc but other really interesting things that happen as well are things such as um i'm guessing you know what your cervix is yes (laughs) Yes. within the cervix there are lots of little crypts that um produce cervical fluid Uh a lot of women call discharge and you should have discharge at certain times of the month. That drives me bonkers when people say, oh, no, I don't have any discharge. It's <laughs> disgusting. It's like, no, it's, it's essential for fertility and a number of other things too. But our cervical crypts regenerate uh-huh. after giving birth. So we're actually slightly more fertile in terms of what's going on with our cervical fluid. And also our hormones will change. So if you are predisposed to thyroid issues Mm -hmm. so you you might have been told you've got borderline thyroid or other kind of issues which are more autoimmune they may trigger during pregnancy or during postpartum Mm -hmm. and your thyroid affects your menstrual cycle and your menstrual cycle affects your thyroid so estrogen in the first half of the cycle suppresses thyroid progesterone nourishes but equally if your thyroid is underactive it's not going to be there's a little little cycle feedback cycle with progesterone and thyroid so that second half of your cycle you're going to get more estrogen dominance um and if you if you've got one autoimmune issue you're likely to have more inflammation in your body which could cause more period pain when you're pregnant or even when you're just in the second half of your cycle but this is obviously what pregnancy is it's like an extended second phase in a way Uh um we become more insulin resistant 
And when we become insulin resistant, uh -huh. um, the excess insulin stimulates our ovaries to produce testosterone. And this is when we have things like polycystic ovarian syndrome, which can result in really long cycles, heavy periods, you can get period pain. Some people will say that you, you get period pain is the estrogen dominance and inflammation and not the PCOS itself. But all those things tend to happen at the same time. So, uh -huh. um, for some women, having children can help with symptoms. I've certainly heard of women with endometriosis saying that it improved after they had children. Some people tell me it's made their symptoms much worse. So, so it does vary. So actually, I just wanted to ask about postpartum depression because I've read also that um, the we don't, I think it's like the I'm not sure if it's amino acids or fatty acids or some kind of acids in our brain that we need that they get depleted from carrying a child. And that, so after you give birth, that it's something that doesn't like restore automatically. And that was like one kind of theory of why people have postpartum is that they're lacking mm -hmm. like nutrients. There's, there's so many theories behind depression and a lot of them do have merit um when we go through the postpartum phase the immediate sort of childbirth and a few days afterwards our hormone levels plummet from being you know quite high in some cases to almost nothing but if you think about all the neurotransmitters that are also hormones such as serotonin dopamine etc they're all going to be affected by that sudden shift um how they're affected that there's so many people saying the evidence shows this and the evidence shows that and they'll argue with one another um mm -hmm. also there is um one person called kelly brogan who talks about um depression being inflammatory mediated so if you've got an autoimmune condition that triggers straight after giving birth or around that uh -huh. time that could trigger it as well our biochemistry changes in so many ways so and again, it could also be nutrient deficiencies, meaning we're not making it enough. Um, hormones are made from cholesterol and other fats. So not eating enough could be causing it. There's, there's a number of things that could be involved. Um, there's a number of people that say it's due to lack of community support. So back in the day, it literally was a village to raise a child and mm -hmm. people would help the mother through the fourth trimester, which is well, you know, the first three months after birth. And she would work on recovery because she's just like changed everything down the stairs and has a new, <laughs> new newborn to look after. But equally, they would help out around the house and do the, the other stuff that she's not doing so she can just rest and recuperate which we don't do anymore. And, you know, we're in the most connected society has ever been in terms of, you know, these phones and everything, but how many people know their next door neighbor, how many people feel they've got a support network that they can actually ask for help when they need it. Yeah. How many people, um, still have people that pop around with like a hot meal when they need it right. when they're feeling unwell. Right. So there's a lot of talk about that as well as, all the possible sort of more scientific explanations as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think community is really important. So many people that have become mobile, like they're living in different places, they're not living by their parents, or I mean, even some parents weren't even able to retire younger, but in the past that, you know, they would be there to support uh, people. I know like a couple that I know that lives near me, the husband's um, mother moved to the city so that um, she could help out just even to pick up the child from school or bring him to school just to spend some time and that I think is so important to have a uh, community and yeah you're right I mean we are so connected right now but virtually it's it's not the same you know you don't have somebody to <laughs> to help out when you need to sleep or something sleep deprivation seems to be a very popular <laughs> problem right after childbirth and so. yeah and actually one of the biggest needle movers on health is getting enough sleep there's so much that happens when we're asleep it's incredible but i've seen sperm count tests improve dramatically just from someone getting enough sleep really no other lifestyle changes that I'm aware of. Wow. So you don't just work with women, you work with couples too, which is... I do some... Yeah, it's mostly women. Sometimes 
the guy is interested as well sometimes because he wants to support his other half sometimes they're both you know they're both open to looking at what's going on so yeah if the woman is doing you know making these changes to her diet I think probably about 90% of them their partner is making the same change as well and Mm -hmm. luckily a lot of the stuff that works for female fertility works for male fertility as well so so what, what could be some of the kinds of things that you would change with your diet like so a lot of it it sounds really really obvious um but it's down to eating real food Uh so making sure you're eating enough fiber plenty of vegetables how many people eat enough vegetables they know they should they just don't um do you eat two portions of leaf dark green leafy vegetables a day probably not do you eat you know (laughs) plenty of other vegetables are you eating you know a good variety of fruits and nuts Mm -hmm. and seeds um and if you're eating seeds are you soaking them overnight to make them anti-inflammatory rather than inflammatory um are you eating oh. food that's processed and therefore it's a more inflammatory profile because it's going slightly more rancid every day um are you getting enough good quality protein and you mentioned about amino acids most people are not eating enough collagen and there's loads of people go, oh, I wouldn't eat that. It's gelatin. That's all the bits sort of boiled up. But actually, you need gelatin for soft tissue growth and support like our uterus. So, you know, making sure you're eating literally all the different amino acids that go into proteins. Mm-hmm. And making sure you're eating enough healthy fat so that you can make hormones. There's so many people on high-carb, low-fat diets, but actually they're not getting enough fat to be able to make enough hormone getting enough exercise getting enough sleep and you know getting rid of excess stress mm-hmm. and i th- we seem to have got to i don't know if you've noticed this so tell me if, if i'm back at the wrong tree but i've noticed certainly amongst friends and acquaintances there's almost like a competition for who's the most stressed or who's the most busy so you uh, say, i'm so busy and everyone's like yes i am too and everyone lists off and it's almost like a competition for who yes <laughs> That is a recurring theme, actually, that has come up, though, in like all these different conversations that I've been having with on different topics. Uh, The first episode, I had a talk with Heidi, who is a yoga instructor, and she's a health and wellness teacher. She was saying, too, I mean, the whole point of yoga is kind of like, get out of that and like, stop being so stressed. (laughs) It takes some time and have some perspective on life. Stress that sets up a whole load of other chemical reaction in your body increases inflammation the base material needed to make stress hormones that means you've got less available to make your sex hormones yeah it's that type a personality like we got to go we got to run we got to do it it's like a kind of false reward maybe or that um if you can be that busy and that stress that you're achieving more but that's not really the truth i mean no. you're probably achieving less because you're so freaked out all the time <laughs> i agree completely <laughs> and it's just i've caught myself saying it i'm sorry i'm really busy because i've got and i'm like nope no <laughs> not helping right we're all busy i mean i do kind of understand too like the information overload everything is going kind of faster and maybe our brains are kind of evolving to kind of catch up into that kind of cycle but there is also i think this kind of like uh ego reward of you know i'm achieving a lot because i'm stressed out and i'm doing it. That's I agree. and it just seems to be a competition but the key thing is there's so many things that we're doing that we can get rid of so you don't have to be that stressed mm-hmm. and like what are you doing to offset that stress what nurturing practices are you doing to you know off that that so it might be yes you're really busy at work but you have your yoga for like half an hour every night Mm -hmm. or even like deep slow breathing like Mm -hmm. 10 minutes before you go to bed or using like a meditation app all those things can really help offset the impact of stress Mm -hmm. yeah and then with less stress then you're gonna have a a higher rate uh, rate of fertility right so Mm -hmm. and do you think that less stress too do you think that uh, PMS I mean I know you said there's tons of theories of of (laughs) why and I mean I think they're all valid yeah the part of my my job is to help work out I have uh, quite a few questionnaires that all my clients have to do as well as tests and you can kind of pinpoint which one is likely to be Right, because each person is unique, right? So 
they all have, depending on how their kind of their belief systems and how they move through the world. Stay tuned for part two. That'll be released in just a few more hours. And I'm so glad that you joined me today. And Rachel, she can be found at thehealthywomb.com. You can work with her in person. You can find tons of resources on her website. You can take classes with her online. There's so much. And we'll cover more of that again, too, in part two of the interview. Definitely check that out because it's just jam-packed with so much information. Thank you for joining me today on the Mindful Soul Centers podcast. And I hope that you'll leave a review, subscribe to the podcast, and uh, find us on Facebook and Instagram the Mindful Soul Center. Until next time.